<laughs> so I'm going to be killed? Yep. <laughs> and I suppose what? My men will just fall down dead and I'll suddenly not want to pull this trigger? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> See? If you could pull that trigger, you totally wouldn't want it. Pinstripes and Poltergeists is the 8th episode of Season 4. It first aired on December 13th, 2009, and was written by Doc Hammer. In it, we catch up with Brock and his new job working for Sphinx. Meanwhile, the Monarch attempts to team up with attorney and supervillain Monstroso to take down Dr. Venture, but is double-crossed and it's up to 21 to make things right. <laughs> When 24 says, Oh, definitely. Maybe you should write it all down on a golden plate. Or maybe get some aviators in a compound in Guyana. The golden plates thing is a reference to the golden plates that the founder of the Church of Latter-day Saints claimed he was given and transcribed to write the Book of Mormon. The compound in Guyana is a reference to the cult leader Jim Jones who led a mass suicide at his compound in Jonestown, Guyana. Monarch tells 21 to cut it out with the alas poor Yorick crap. A reference to the famous line from Hamlet in which a gravedigger holds the skull of Yorick and says, Alas, poor Yorick. Hunter Gathers refers to the Sphinx agent with information on Monstroso as Jimmy Olsen, a reference to the news reporter who worked at the Daily Planet with Clark Kent in the Superman comics. That same guy later pretends to have Tourette's syndrome and says, Whoop! Uh, pickle penis! Pickle penis! My underwear is on fire! This is lifted straight from a TV special about Tourette's Syndrome that Doc Hammer saw as a young man. For better or worse, I couldn't find a clip. Along with 21, straight up dressing like a Jedi, 24 says, 21! You must go to the Dagobah system! There you will meet the Jedi Master who instructed uh, me! A good one. Which is lifted straight from this scene in The Empire Strikes Back. Ooh. We'll go to the Dagobah system. Dagobah system. There you will learn from Yoda, the Jedi Master who instructed me. This is the first appearance of Monstroso, however, he'd previously been mentioned as early as season one. I'm insane! I'm insane! Look at these! There's a picture of you in Monstroso's lap! That was a party, and look at his lap, it's huge! There's like five of us on it. Yeah, right! Just summon the others and get over here! Ah, uh, there are no others. Yeah, most of them joined up with Monstroso's crew when he went inside. Yeah, we kind of lost touch after that. You see my brother? Nah, he's probably sitting down torturing Monstroso with Snapple facts. Yeah, I don't think- Holy moly! That guy is almost a truck! Billy refers to himself and Pete as Quiz Boy and the Pink Phantom. Clearly, they were still workshopping Pete's eventual alter ego, the Pink Pilgrim. This episode explains for the first time that Sphinx is now a force for good, making sense of why Brock would join up with them, and what their reason for existing is. There's a quick callback to Billy and Hunter's past together, as detailed in The Invisible Hand of Fate. How's our middle high five treating you these days, huh? With all the respect, I hate you. I know! And we get to see for the first time since the first episode, Speedy, the henchman who was unceremoniously killed by a rampaging Brock Samson. Come on, Speedy. <laughs> wow. He's really on there good. In one of the coolest callbacks ever, we get to see a fight between 21 and Brock that mirrors the dialogue from when 21 confronted him with a lightsaber in Tag's Hail You're It. Brock Sampson. At last we meet. Brock Sampson. At last we meet. Do I know you? Uh, uh, don't pull that shit with me! Do I know you? <laughs> I don't know why you're here, and I don't care. I have been waiting for this moment for a year. Boo. Ugh. I've been Jim. Boo. Oh, oh, oh my no, God. no, 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 no. He's gonna so f***ing pop me. 
This is the first time that Sphinx's ability to erase people's memories comes up, a device that will be returned to throughout the rest of Season 4. And more of a funny thing I noticed than canon, but this episode features the line, We all joined the OSI with high-eyed dreams of saving the world from baddies. And what did we get? Hot bureaucracy poured in our laps! Which is strikingly similar to Doc's line from Home is Where the Hate Is. Ah, uh, I don't even know why we're doing this. We kinda have to. It's just one of the things that comes with this life you chose. Chose my keister! My dad dumped this life on my lap like a cup of scalding hot responsibility. <laughs> If you're late to the Venture Brothers party, then you may not realize that season four was cut into two eight episode halves. So this was the last new episode for a while. And what an episode to go out on. I previously referred to seasons four and five as the era of growth. And to further zoom in on it, I'd say that this first half of season four is the growing pains part of that larger growth era. Trust me, I appreciate the hell out of this show for having the balls to shake up the status quo the way that they did, but this episode brings back Brock and spiritually brings back 24, and it just feels so damn good. I mean, that moment at the end of the episode when Hank finally sees Brock again is maybe one of the most cathartic, happy moments to ever be on TV. Watching these eight episodes for the first time really caused my feelings for Venture Brothers to wane a bit, but this episode felt like Jackson and Doc saying, trust us, we're heading in the right direction. Despite my initial apprehension about season four, I love the journey that this show goes on, and I love the Venture Brothers. As always, thank you for watching, and go Team Venture! Tune in next week for the Diving Bell vs. the Butter Glider. If you dug this video, share it with a friend, and if there was some huge glaring thing that I missed in this video, follow me on Instagram at VentureVerseGuide to see these videos a week early and offer your input before I upload the final product.